Welcome to the PBN podcast, Melanie. What a pleasure and a joy to finally sit down with you. Oh, it's so good to be here. And uh, it's just really great to see you again. So Millie and I have known each other for many years. Uh, we've crossed paths at many events um, and have been involved in lots of wonderful projects, bringing the vegan message to as many people as we can humanly do. And it's been uh, such an interesting ride, but I'm really looking forward to diving into your history and learning a bit about how you got to this point, but also learning about all the exciting and amazing things that you're doing today. But before we do that, let's go back in time. And, you know, you probably told this story many times, but for those of the, those of our audience who haven't heard it, like, what is your vegan story? How did you discover this lifestyle and where did it all begin for you? Yeah, sure. And it began a long time ago. Um, it began, um, you know, I, I think it was probably when I was a very young child, um, we adopted a puppy um, who my dog Fritz and he became my best friend and he was like a brother to me. And, you know, like so many people, um, certainly in the West, I grew up with a dog who I loved like a family member. And I also grew up eating animals. I grew up eating meat, eggs, and dairy. And um, I was, of course, a person who who cared about animals. Um, most people do. I certainly would never have wanted to contribute to their suffering, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet, despite all this, I spent, you know, a lot of my life uh, petting my dog with one hand, you know, and eating a pork chop with the other, a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sentient or conscious as my dog. Um, and I just didn't make the connection for so much of my life between, you know, the, the meat or eggs or dairy products on my plate and the living being they or beings that they had come from. So one day, it was 1989, I was 23 at the time, um, I ended up eating a hamburger that turned out to have been contaminated with Campylobacter, which is like the red meat version of salmonella. And I got really, really sick and I wound up in the hospital. I was on intravenous antibiotics and I I felt like I was going to die. And I emerged from that experience vowing never to eat meat again. And at the time in my mind, it wasn't because I was concerned with, you know, the, the implications of eating animals. It was just like, you know, when you get so sick, you just, the last thing you ate, you're like, I'm never touching it again. So that's basically what happened to me. I was just, I was like disgusted by meat. And so I had to learn how to cook for myself and how to shop for myself. And I basically had to learn how to be a vegetarian at the time. And this was in the eighties. Right. So, um, but as I was learning and, um, you know, reading about vegetarianism, I, of course, stumbled upon information about animal agriculture. Um, I quickly became vegan. Um, What I learned just shocked and horrified me. Like, I could not believe the extent of the suffering of non-human animals. I couldn't believe, you know, the environmental impact. And this was back in the 80s, and there was a lot less known about some of these issues, right? And I was also really shocked to hear about, you know, the correlation between eating animals and, and, you know, disease. Um, But what shocked me in some ways even more was that nobody I talked to about what I was learning was willing to hear what I had to say. And they would respond almost consistently with something like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. They'd call me a crazy vegan hippie propagandist. This wall would just go up as soon as I opened my mouth. And, you know, these were people like myself, like I had been most of my life, all of my life, you know, they were compassionate people. They were rational people. They were people who loved our family dog. They were people who would never want to hurt animals. They were people who were concerned about social justice, my friends and my family members. Um, But, you know, they just didn't want to hear what I had to say. And that really struck me. And that's what made me so curious about, you know, something more is going on here, right? What, What is going on? How is it possible that rational, compassionate people just stop thinking and feeling when it comes to this issue of animal agriculture. And and that was what really led me, you know, not just on my vegan journey, but on my vegan activist journey. That was what led me on the journey to do the work that, you know, I do today. That's an amazing story. And and one of the most powerful things about you is your your educated and articulate way of explaining things. Um, You are a a 
scholar in what you do and you know obviously that world requires huge amounts of study and and deep understanding of the human mind you're a trained psychologist um how did that journey begin how did you get into that world because obviously it's quite a specific thing to get involved in you know what inspired you to sort of take that route yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for those words. Um, it, well, it was this experience that I had. Um, I was always very much concerned with social justice, and you know, with and then after you know, I had this hamburger incident um, with animal protection and animal rights. And I first actually became an educator. I went to graduate to graduate school and got my um, degree, my master's degree in education, teaching and. Um, curriculum development. And, you know, I was, I believed that education was the key to changing the world. You know, if I could just get people to understand what I understand, this will help change things. And, you know, as we know, as anybody who's a vegan or a vegan advocate knows, um, the facts don't sell the ideology. Now, good education is not just presenting facts, it's helping people think differently. But what I discovered was that, um, you know, I was actually giving these courses. I was working in a, I was working as a teacher, but I was also doing um, courses in community centers on vegetarianism or veganism actually at the time. And I'd have people come and they would do these little workshops that I had with like somebody who was cooking vegan foods and people were, who were curious would, veg curious would come and they would leave completely convinced like, my God, of course. I mean, we don't have to eat animals to survive. It's not healthy. Those poor animals, I don't want to be, mm -hmm. be a part of that. But then they wouldn't actually be vegan or vegetarian. Mm -hmm. They would go right back to eating animals. And so I became really curious. And I was like, so what, what's going on here? How is it that you can see some of these horrible graphic movies, for example? And then like two days later, you're at the McDonald's drive through and, and you cared when you saw it, like you were upset mm. by it. So what's going on psychologically? And so it was this coupled with this experience that I had about these, you know, this defensive reaction to whenever I would say I'm vegan, you know, oh, did you know that made me realize like there's something deeper going on psychologically that is causing people to basically shut out any information that challenges their existing beliefs around eating animals. And, and so this is what led me to, to go in and study psychology. And I studied, um, I did my, my PhD in psychology and I studied broadly the psychology of violence and nonviolence. And really I was looking at like, what is it, if I could understand what causes well-intentioned people to participate in, you know, to support atrocities basically, then maybe I could understand what will help reverse that process or undo some of that process. And what I discovered was that, you know, the very same psychological mechanisms that enable humans to carry out harm against other humans enable us to carry out harm against other animals. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of, of eating animals, specifically the psychology of carnism. And in my research, I, I interviewed vegans and vegetarians and mostly meat eaters and butchers and meat cutters and some people who had killed, you know, raised and killed their own animals for food. And I discovered that there is a very specific psychology around that enabled people to either eat or kill or process dead animals. Um, none of these people were comfortable with it. Vegans had said that they had been uncomfortable as non-vegans, but they weren't really consciously aware of it. And yet everybody was nevertheless participating in this problem. And so this is what led me to identify what I came to call carnism, the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. It's amazing. And, you know, that's uh, such a powerful way to describe the problem, because I think I think you talk about it in, in the video that I first when I first found you on social media, when I first discovered your work was this carnism video, which went completely viral. It's been seen by millions and millions of people. And it's such a powerful way to what I call unlock a realization, because innately we know these things. But when a person such as yourself gives it a name and points to it, it makes these the unseen scene. And I think that's what you talk about as well, that carnism hides in plain sight. It's all around us all the time. It's such an ubiquitous part of our culture that we never question it. But when you give some something a name and you point at it it's sort of like it's the illusion that sort of hides it or shrouds it becomes clear and then people be, can begin to unpick or undo that cultural conditioning or that perhaps that programming that they have acquired as children i'm very fascinated though about it like why do some people 
get it and some people don't you know as a young child I was very sensitive I would cry really easily I was really kind of I loved animals I had cats and mice and dogs and but I didn't make that connection. I continued to eat meat up until my early 20s. And this is something I've asked myself all the time. Why did it take external education to unlock that realization when there are many, many children who reject or shun meat from a very, very young age? Um, you know, I'd love to understand the sort of like psychology behind that. Have you got any theories on why that might be? It's a great question. And, um, you know, there isn't, there's, there's, there isn't research that shows like, why is it that some people make the connection before others? And what is it that causes us to make the, the connection? I mean, I'd be very, very interested to see, interested to see studies. Um, and, you know, we do know that we're all conditioned to not make the connection, right? So there are a lot of factors that can come into play. Um, there's one interesting study that has been done by, uh, was done by a colleague of mine and his colleagues looking at, um, they, they developed what they called a carnism scale and it's to measure levels of carnism in individuals. Like meaning mm. if you're high in carnism, you are more likely to feel comfortable eating more types of animals and animals that are more likely to resemble their original forms. You're more comfortable with the whole idea of eating animals. And if you're high in car carnism, this, this, you tend to also be high in what's called social dominance orientation, meaning the belief in um, authoritarianism and sometimes referred to as right-wing authoritarianism. So there are some, there is a little bit of research that suggests that there are certain social attitudes, um, mm -hmm. particularly this belief that, um, you know, the, in authoritarianism, this belief in, um, you know, hierarchy, in a sense, um, it correlates with the belief in eating animals or the comfort eating animals. But it's much more than this. So, you know, people who are more sensitive, who are higher in sensitivity, you might have heard of HSP, for example, highly sensitive people. People who are higher in sensitivity are quite likely, and I'm. this is anecdotal, uh, evidence that I'm sharing with you. This is my experience, and my experience spans about three decades of, of you know, paying attention to this. So it's a lot of experience. It's, it is, <laughs> and I'm saying it's also anecdotal. But but people, what I have observed over and over and over again is people high in sens sensitivity tend to be more responsive to um, at least certain types of messaging. Um, you know, they people who have a stronger disgust response also tend to be more uh, likely to make that connection between meat and the living being it once was. Um, then you have people who have strong sense of social justice to begin with. It depends on whether your family raised you to think critically and to feel that you had a right to think critically. Some people are completely on board with veganism and believe, you know, really clear that that veganism is the way to go. And they nevertheless have such a strong need for social belonging that the fear of rejection from their community or their in-group or not being part of the group overwhelms their ability to um, either you know, become vegan or sustain veganism. Um, there are so many different reasons for people mm. to be more or less recept receptive to the message. But the good news for us, for those of us who you know are really concerned about bringing about change as quickly as possible, is we don't need everybody to go vegan. We just need enough people to be vegan enough. And when enough people are vegan enough, then we will have a tipping point that will help us really move toward a vegan world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the vegan world obviously is made up of human beings. And, you know, you said that you went back to school to do your doctorate and, and explore psychology behind eating animals. When you learned and sort of the more you delve into human behavior, um, how did you avoid becoming sort of angered or depressed or misanthropic about our species? Because let's be honest, you know, human beings are a pretty destructive race of beings, whether it's emotionally or physically, you know, the way we've proliferated across this planet, the way we've destroyed everything. Like you've obviously made it your life's work to understand the psychological kind of framework of humankind. Um, what keeps you positive about us as a, as a species and, and stops you slipping into that angry misanthropic state? Well, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that anger is, you know, anger, anger exists for a reason. And, you know, for people who are listening who are thinking, yeah, that's me, I'm really angry and, you know, feeling maybe bad about being angry. Um, anger is a normal and natural and healthful response. It's the emotional response to injustice, to, to witnessing or experiencing injustice. And so I want to just acknowledge that it makes sense that we're angry. It makes sense for people to feel misanthropic because there's a lot of reason to be misanthropic in the world. Um, 
And nevertheless, if we, you know, have any hope of um, transforming this world and saving this world, we need to be able to relate to our anger in a way that um, allows us to use it productively and not end up consumed by it. And I think this has been my lesson and, you know, a big lesson for me and a big takeaway for me that I, I want to share. Um, when we relate to our anger in a healthy way, we recognize, of course, it makes sense that I'm angry when I see what's happening to the world. And, you know, just this, the hubris of humanity, this arrogance and human supremacy that's ravaging the planet and all of the inhabitants, essentially. Um, when we can, when we relate to our anger in a healthy way, we recognize it for what it is, which is an emotional response to, it's, it's a sign that our moral compass is working. You know, that we're noticing something that's unjust. We're human. We're human. Like we're human and we're in human psyches. And when we relate to our anger in an unhealthy way, instead of recognizing our anger as a data point, you know, we become consumed by our anger. We blend with it. We look at the world through the lens of our anger. And more importantly, our anger takes on the charge of contempt. Contempt is really a red flag that we're not relating to our anger or to ourselves in a way that's healthy and good for us and sustainable. Contempt basically is a feeling we have when we've, it's an indication that we've placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority and mm. that we're perceiving another or others as, as somehow inferior, as not having the same intrinsic or inherent worth that we do, as not being worthy of treated being treated with respect. And this is what really can consume us and, and, and create the misanthropy that can be so hard to navigate. And a way to, you know, protect ourselves from that is understanding and awareness. It's really, really important. The more that we understand um, why people are the way they are, why we do what we do, the easier it is for us not to put a label on somebody as less than or as bad and the more we recognize that like each and every one of us is nothing more nor less than the hard wiring and physiology that we've been born with and every single experience we have had throughout our lives. We, we cannot be anything different than, than who or what we are psychologically, essentially, and, and physiologically. Expecting somebody to be different than who or how they are. It's like expecting a tree that's been rained on not to be wet. This doesn't mean that we don't work to change things. It doesn't mean that we don't work to create an environment so people can grow into their healthier or better selves. It just means that we take away the judgment and the expectation that people can actually and should actually not be where they are at in their lives. And this can make it a lot easier for us. And of course, putting boundaries up is, is very important. And this is something that I've learned as well. It's very easy to immerse yourself in the sea of suffering. You know, once you become aware of it, you see it everywhere. You can't ever unsee it. You know, I walk down the street and I'm, you know, looking at piles of garbage overflowing from, you know, if I'm down in the city from a dumpster and I'm hearing drills and I'm just thinking about like, oh my God, what are we doing to this planet? It's just, it's so easy to go there in your mind. And it's really important to put boundaries around what you expose yourself to, especially if you're a sensitive person and to give yourself permission to do that. Because mm. those of us who are advocates and who are awake to the problems in the world, we often feel like we have an obligation, like almost a moral obligation to like take in all the suffering, watch those graphic videos, you know, like be on top of everything, but that it kills us. You know, we have to really prevent ourselves from taking in too much so that we can do the work that we need to do for the long haul. Absolutely. And one of the most fantastic ways in which you've been, you know, helping people understand themselves better is are your books. One of the, the ones I absolutely love, and I know one of the most successful is Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. And it really sums up the idea of carnism, um, which in many ways feels like this powerful denial system built into who we are as creatures. Um, with the, with the work that you've done and over the, the many years in which this movement, the vegan movement has been evolving, what do you see as the sort of key limiting factor? What do you think is causing uh, humanity not to shift away from the way we behave? Because obviously the writing's on the wall. We know that um, agriculture is the leading driver for climate breakdown, greenhouse gas emissions, species extinction. There are just so, there are just so many problems, but yet we are collectively living in this sort of denial state. Um, why do you think that is? Um, 
I mean, there are a lot of reasons for it, and denial is a, a coping a coping mechanisms that that people people can use as a healthy coping mechanism. Sometimes we use denial because we just it is our way of surviving. Because if we didn't live with some degree of denial, you know, we might not be able to get out of bed every day. Like we might just not keep going and opt to not keep going. Um, but we really don't have. It's a great question that you ask, and it's it's a a question that I can't answer fully. Um, what I can say is that there is movement and there is change and there is awareness happening. And we can see that there's, there is or certainly seems to be a, a real acceleration of the important conversations that we need to be having if we hope to save our planet alongside the acceleration of destruction. You know, we can see Me Too and Black Lives Matter and, you know, now the climate movement, climate justice. Um, we can, we really can see that these conversations are finally starting to pierce the sort of collective barrier that kept them from reaching um, enough of the public to really bring about significant change. And that that's very hopeful. Um, I do think that we... One of the most important things that we can be doing, well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of great work that is happening. And for many people who are advocates, particularly vegan advocates, right, because the vegan movement is still quite young compared to a number of other social justice movements. And it's it's really easy for a vegan to or as a vegan to feel like nothing is changing because things are not changing as quickly as we would hope. And to feel like, you know, we, we, we are, we see the problem and it's so enormous and so all encompassing, it can really make us feel despair. So it's important to know that things are in fact changing. Um, I've traveled all over the world. Um, I've been to 50 or so countries, some of them multiple times in six continents. And I have not had one exception to being told by people in the country, people in positions of leadership in the vegan movement and people who are um, non-vegans in the media saying to me, the past three years, the conversation about veganism, completely different. Like mm. it's really, really like breaking through now. So there is reason to be hopeful and there are things that we can do so that we facilitate, you know, that we increase the chances that our movement is gonna be successful. And, and one of those, the most important things I think we can do as a movement is to, to really commit to being healthy individuals and healthy relational beings. Because mm. at, at the end of the day, like if you think about the, you know, most pressing problems in our world, you know, ranging from poverty and war and animal exploitation, climate change, racism, sexism, speciesism, so on and so forth, and the most pressing personal problems we face, all of these problems share a common denominator. And that common denominator is relational dysfunction. That's mm -hmm. dysfunctional ways of relating, you know, between social groups, between humans and non-humans, between human individuals, between us and ourselves. This is the common denominator. And if we hope to create a resilient, powerful movement for animals and beyond uh, and to contribute to a healthier world, I believe that we really need to, to improve our ability to relate effectively. And this way we prevent our movement from cannibalizing itself. And we are much, much more effective in getting our message out there to others outside of our movement. It's such an important point. And I talk about this with people all the time about the, the sort of the elements and aspects that slow down the growth of the movement that stop people from entering the conversation. You've done many fantastic talks about toxic communication and how the sort of toxicity of the way we talk to each other breaks down uh, the forward movement of our entire um, kind of kind of forward trajectory, really. It's kind of like a, an, an, a self creating inertia that we seem to sort of all want to do by fighting you know we call it infighting infighting within the movement and it's caused huge amounts of trauma and and sort of you know backsliding really of what we're trying to achieve what are some of the sort of key things to look out for to try to understand when toxic communication is happening not just maybe within our organization or within our relationships but also in the movement at large what does it look like and what are some of the things that we can and should be doing to try to sort of um, you know, 
unpick it or, or, or shift away from it? It's a, those are great questions. And um, yeah, I'm actually working right now. I've been working for uh, the past couple of months on putting together resources specifically on infighting to raise awareness of what is it? What does it look like? How do you identify it? And how do you work to prevent and resolve it? So, um, and I agree with you, this is a big, really important topic. Um, all movements have, you know, what, what we might call infighting. It's not uncommon. Um, and it's the, the more we can resolve, prevent and resolve infighting, the more resilient we'll be as a movement. And mm. so one of the things, you know, just on a, on a more abstract level is that I think we, we really need to commit, commit each one of us to commit to building our own relational literacy, which is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy ways of relating. It's not rocket science. I have a book specifically for this. It's a one-stop guide to building relational literacy calling, called Getting Relationships Right. We're building in lots of materials, free materials, training materials for vegans to help them communicate and relate more effectively and healthfully. If we think of relational dysfunction as like the meta problem facing our world, then relational literacy is really a meta solution. Mm. And, um, you know, and so we all have a, a meta mission, regardless of what we're working toward, what kind of change we're working toward, we're working to create a more relational world for everyone. And so it, I want to just say that it, it makes sense that we do not communicate in the most perfect ways with each other. And that toxic communication, which I call non-relational communication is really epidemic because vegans are people and people don't get mm. any training in how to be healthy relational beings or how to communicate effectively. You know, we just kind of learn from our parents and we learn from TV and what we learn is usually counterproductive. Um, so one of the things that's really important to do is to, to learn about, and, and again, I'm, I'm putting together um, materials specifically on this, but what change strategies actually work? Because one of the reasons we fight with each other, um, same reason we fight with other people, is because we have a different idea about what change strategy is appropriate. So some people will say, for example, the way that we get the vegan movement to change or people to change is by shaming them. You know, it, it's very common. Shaming is an incredibly common tactic to bring about, you know, to try to get people to adopt a particular perspective. If I just tell you how wrong you are and make mm. you realize like how your opinions are not good enough um, or you're not good enough if you're not doing what I say, then you'll finally agree with me. Except that all of the literature, I mean, decades of literature examining shaming tactics and shame as a method to try to bring about change shows that shame is in fact counterproductive mm. not just unproductive and damaging right counterproductive and damaging and yet we do it over and over again i mean there are very few instances in which two actually shaming might not be counterproductive but there are lots of caveats with that right so but we do it because it's what we learned so one thing that we can commit to doing you know is to not shaming others if whether we're trying to change them or whether we're just angry at them, because when we commit, when we, when we contribute to the epidemic of shame in our movement and beyond, we're basically watering the seeds of relational dysfunction and, you know, contributing to the very problem we're trying to resolve. Studies have shown that when people feel shamed, you know, or even the threat of being shamed, they become defensive. They become less rational, less connected with their empathy, less likely to actually do what you want them to do. And on top of it, more likely to reproduce shaming behaviors later on in the day to other people in their lives or back at you, you know, in the moment. So it's really shaming behaviors are really epidemic and uh, contagious, I should say, and epidemic. So just so listeners know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about shaming behaviors. So it's it's not an abstraction, you know, it's um, there's uh. When I'm talking about relationally healthy behaviors, um, I'm talking about behaviors that are non-shaming, a relationally healthy behavior. And, and I'm talking about communication when I say behaviors, because a be, you know communication is the primary way we relate. So the formula that um, can be really helpful for people to be aware of, the formula for healthy relating applies to communication, it applies to interactions, it applies to relationships, it applies to basically every kind of interaction or relationship we might have. And it is to practice integrity and honor dignity. And this leads to a sense of mutual connection and security. And I'll unpack this for a minute, but, but this really is the centerpiece of everything I'm talking about here. So a healthy relational dynamic 
or relationship in general. It reflects integrity. And integrity is the integration of the core moral values of compassion and justice. So when you practice integrity towards somebody, um, you're basically treating them with respect. You're treating them the way you would want to be treated in their position. So you practice integrity and you honor dignity. And when you honor dignity, that means you perceive the other person, the other being, as being fundamentally worthy, no less worthy than you or anyone else on the planet of being treated with respect. Mm -hmm. When you do this, it leads to a sense of greater connection and security. So in a healthy relationship, there's a high level of integrity and honoring dignity. And there's a high level of security and connection that people feel, or a lot of security and connection people feel. And if you think about any relationship in your life that you think is a good relationship, chances are you trust that that person will practice integrity toward you, treat you with respect, and they see you as fundamentally worthy and you feel connected and secure with them. Mm -hmm. And you can apply this formula to any interaction, to any communication at any moment. And it exists on a spectrum, right? You can be more a behavior can be more or less relational. Shaming behaviors are non-relational behaviors. When you shame somebody, you're not honoring their dignity. You're actually perceiving them as and treating them as they're le as though they're less than, less worthy of being treated with respect than you or somebody else. It's very demeaning, isn't it? As a as a sort of practice, you demean someone. You're demeaning somebody exactly, and we are all so like allergic to being shamed because we've been born into this profoundly relationally dysfunctional world. Like the level of the, our collective level of relational literacy is so low. We're basically still living in the relational dark ages. So we're mm -hmm. just walking around, like just traumatizing each other and shaming each other and, you know, and not even realizing the harm that we're causing to others and to ourselves in the process. But this, but this is the beauty of relational literacy. It can be learned and it's a game changer. As soon as you learn it, your life transforms. It's like the difference mm. between being able to read and write, being literate or not, is just so profound. And it's the same thing with relational literacy. So if each person in our movement, in the vegan movement, you know, and beyond, of course, but let's just talk about the movement now. If we spend as much time um, working to, to build relational literacy ourselves as we do trying to call out vegans who aren't vegan enough mm. or, you know, debate the meaning of the term vegan, we'd probably transform our movement in, you know, in no time. So any vegan, you know, who really wants to build a resilient movement in the one thing they can do is to build relational literacy. And this enables them to be more effective in their outreach and in their relationships with other vegans and in how they relate to themselves, you know, learning to take care of themselves, put up boundaries practice sustainability so that they don't burn out it's such great advice and and i know from my interactions with you over the years your advice on communication and relationship building um has been really fundamental in helping me improve my relationships of course your books as well um that have really helped me learn to communicate with others because there's there's what there's the inner world of us as human beings that sort of what seems sometimes feels like this crazy frantic world inside our heads where i'm tapping on my head here um and and then there's obviously our hearts as well there's our emotions and you know they often feel massively conflicted and when we try to communicate with other people really at the end of the day most people just want to be heard and seen um and loved um, and when we get into these these kind of conflicts with people that we might not necessarily know or people that we know and love, it's very painful because you, they cannot seem to understand or connect with the words that you're using. And there are many times I think, gosh, words are so primitive. With the way we communicate with each other, words are primitive, they're clumsy, they're, they're careless, they, they sort of fall out of our mouths and cause so much pain <laughs> that there has to be a better way to communicate. And, and, and there is, it's the space between the words, it's our body language, it's the what goes on actually in our minds. And one of my, and we'll talk about TED Talks in a minute, but one of my most favorite um, kind of quotes is from the guy who is a guy ross guy rob who created ted um he said that as a speaker which could be applied to anything as someone communicating information your job is to take the ideas in your head 
break them down into words, throw them across the room in, in word form and let the person on the other end rebuild them into a picture in their minds. And if you can do that successfully, you can transform people's lives. Um, because with that power of communication and arranging the words in this magical way, people can either get it or they become incredibly triggered and become highly emotional and sort of react really or overreact to what you've said. So the artistry of words and the way we communicate is a life's work, isn't it? Like that's what you're saying, that it's something that we genuinely need to work on and develop in ourselves. So we're not born with this. We have to learn it. It is a, in an artistry that if we learn it and we master it, it will help us transform our movement and, of course, the world because, you know, we're doing this work with our voices. Our, vo our voices are often what lead uh, the work that we're doing, the way we communicate and the way we bring people together. But um, thank you for that great advice. I think um, we'll definitely be checking out these uh, materials that you're going to be publishing soon. So I'm looking forward to that. Going back to your um, TED talk and talking about carnism again, TED is obviously a fantastic platform, technology, entertainment, and design. It has been hugely successful helping get, inf helping get ideas and concepts to millions and millions of people. You, your talk has been seen by millions of people and it's been hugely successful. What was it like planning for that? And uh, what was the, the reception like when you, when it first sort of dropped? Yeah, thank you. Um, it was, it, it's, um, it was an interesting experience and the planning was a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot of planning and a lot of hard work went into that um, simply because, you know, you have 18 minutes to deliver, you know, a talk on material asking people to, you know, basically fundamentally change the way that they think about something that's really, you know, deeply ingrained in their lives and has been throughout their entire lifetime. And so there's, it's, it's a challenge to try to do that. And there's only so much you can get done in a short period of time. Um, but knowing that that was the challenge, um, you know, I, I really just, just committed to uh, practicing that and putting it together and testing it. I mean, I had, I had test, I tested it a number of times. I would have focus groups come and give them a presentation, find out what works, what doesn't work, and then tweak the presentation accordingly. Mm. So there was a lot of thought and practice that went into it. Um, but apart from the, the practical piece of it, it was a very interesting experience um, in that I, I was, very unsure about how it would come across and and how how basically how it would land because I had only ever given my presentation on carnism in I think 45 minutes was the shortest I could get it and even then I was worried that it was too short um, you know to do justice to an issue that's basically triggering it's speaking to something that can trigger a high degree of defensiveness. Um, so you really need to be able to, to have enough of a conversation to, to bypass some of that and to work with that when that comes up. So I wasn't sure how it would land, but um, it did go over very well. I was, I gave the talk in Munich here in Germany, um, you know, which is kind of like the, it, let's just say it's not a vegan city. It's, you know, it's a, there's a lot of veganism here in Germany and that's great. Um, but I wouldn't call Munich, you know, the most vegan of cities in the world. Um, so anyway, I, I was very happy with it. I got a standing ovation and it confirmed my, my sense that it really is about simply being able to, that most people are in alignment with the message. You know, it really mm. confirmed my sense that most people really are in alignment with vegan values. You know, vegan values are all our values. Um, and it simply is a matter of bypassing this carnistic defensiveness so that people can hear our message. The message is really important that we have, and it's learning how to deliver it in a way that increases the chances that people will hear it. Now, of course, for advocates listening um, to this, don't feel like if people are not receptive to your message, it means that you haven't advocated effectively. You could be, you know, as totally fluent in the art of advocacy. And if people are not ready to hear what you have to say, they're not going to hear what you have to say. And this is where, you know, knowing when not to advocate is really important. One of the other topics that you've touched on is the, um, the sort of the architecture of oppression and how the oppressive systems that intertwine our entire world or kind of weave, it, weave their way through our entire world are all interconnected. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your book, Powerarchy, and how the idea for that came. And well, how does veganism and animal rights fit into this sort of 
you know, oppressive structures that that really pervade our entire world. Um, yeah, thank you. I I I um, when I wrote Powerarchy, which I'm now in conversation with my publisher actually about revising, retitling, and re-releasing. Um, so, and I'll I'll keep you posted on that. Um, I was really thinking about, uh, or, or what I did was I expanded the work that I had done on carnism and deconstructing carnism. And so, when I was writing my dissertation, which then became on the psychology of eating animals and on carnism, which then became why we love dogs, eat pigs, and wear cows. You know, I was. I was looking at the system that I had come to call carnism. And, you know, the question that I asked was not simply what is this system, but how is the system structured? You know, because if we can understand the pillars of the system, you know, what keeps this system intact specifically, Mm -hmm. concretely, what are the specific psychological and social mechanisms that enable the system to stay alive? Because once you can see them, they lose, as you pointed out, they lose a lot of their power over you. Um, and so I, I expanded that into my work um, that t- turned into the powerarchy. And I, I, because when I had written and analyzed um, my work on carnism, I realized that I had a, a blueprint essentially for all systems of oppression. And when we look at oppression from a psychological perspective, we can see that all of these systems, well, from a sociological perspective, all of these systems are structurally similar. And most importantly, for my, you know, for my work was they all reflect and reinforce the same mentality. So even though, like, I really want to be clear, the victims of each set of, of each oppressive system, the experience of each set of victims will always be unique. I do not want to compare victims' experience because that's not respectful. However, the systems themselves are structurally similar and the mentality that drives these systems and keeps them alive is the same. And this mentality is based on a core belief I call it the belief in a hierarchy of moral worth, that some individuals or groups are more worthy of moral consideration or being treated with respect than others. And in powerarchy, I deconstructed these systems. Here are the defense mechanisms. You know, here's how they keep themselves alive. Here's the kind of meta mentality um, that keeps these systems alive. And then talked about ways to to work toward transformation. Um, And... um, I, you know, I, what I was very interested in is looking at oppression through the lens of psychology and, you know, even more specifically through the lens of relationality. And in Powerarchy, I talk about how oppression, whether it's oppression of non-human beings or human beings, reflects and reinforces this non-relational mentality. Basically, It reflects and reinforces the mentality that's on the opposite end of the formula for healthy relating that I told you about earlier. I talked about a healthy relational dynamic reflecting integrity and um, honoring dignity and leading to connection and security. An unhealthy dynamic or a non-relational dynamic does the opposite. It violates integrity. It harms dignity and it leads to a sense of disconnection and insecurity and also power imbalances. Um, in between individuals and groups. And so, so that was really the focus of that book. Amazing. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. And I've learned a lot about the way these systems all interconnect. One of the elements of veganism or one of the elements of the vegan movement is the conversation uh, around intersectionality, which obviously is a, is a very divisive topic because depending on who you speak to, everybody has a different understanding of what intersectionality means. From my perspective, intersectionality is the intersection between movements, between social justice movements, the places where they they cross over, the kind of Venn diagram, really, uh, between, say, feminism and veganism. You know, some people might have the conversation around, if you're a feminist and you care about reproductive rights, then we should be talking about how female animals, female bovine animals are being exploited for their reproductive organs. That is the intersectionality between the rights of animals, which is veganism, and of course, feminism, which is the rights of human animals. Um, it causes a lot of conflict in our movement. You know, we've had personal, you and I have had personal experience in this in this conversation a lot, a lot of disagreements, not between us, but between others. Um, and it has caused a lot of conflict. I think it is an important conversation. I think it's important to, for the movement, for people out there to understand their privilege as a person, to understand that you can't just make assumptions that everyone is just going to get it. They're not going to just understand that veganism is an important imperative. 
But then human, uh, the human imperative is also important as well. Our lives and, and the sufferings of our fellow human beings are just as important. We can't just, dis, dis, we can't sort of elevate one over over the other for the for the sake of sort of the vegan movement or animal non-human animal rights. How do we? how do we reconcile these differences? Because it seems to sort of be this, and it's all intertwined with infighting as well. You know, how people have disagreements about, you know, just how good are you? Uh, just, just what kind of vegan activist are you if you forget about human rights? How do we have the conversation so that when we are advocating for animal rights, we're not forgetting about human rights as well? That's a big question. Um, that's a really big question. I think, um, you know, in my my more recent book, The Vegan Matrix, I, I talk about this issue. Um, and I just, I want to put out there, like, there's a, been a lot of great work done on, you know, people have been looking at um, the intersection of social oppressions um, for, for a very long time and looking at ways to transform systems of oppression for a very long time. And a lot of great work has been done. Um, what I have done is I've drawn on that work and added Added to it and looked at it and reanalyzed it through through a relational lens. And, and that is the lens that I would also bring to this piece of the conversation that we're having now. Um, it's, it's tricky. Um, it's very important that we, um, the, the nature of these, not what I call non-relational systems, right? They're systems of oppression, um, like speciesism or carnism or patriarchy, racism, class of, classism, and so on. You know, the nature of these systems is to keep us comfortably unaware of the privilege that we have when we occupy a position of privilege in the system and to cause us to feel automatically defensive against anyone or anything that would help us become aware of the privilege that we may have within the system. Now, vegans, you know, who are listening to this are probably very familiar with the fact that, you know, as soon as you say I'm vegan to a non-vegan, the non-vegan might start out by telling you all the reasons that veganism is wrong, but they never even heard of the concept of veganism until you opened your mouth a few minutes ago, right? So this experience and I do not mean to say that the experience of being vegan is in any way the same um, or dealing with non-vegans is in any way the same as the experience of being um, a woman or a person who's like not man dealing with men um, or of a person of color dealing with white people. It's not the same experience. But the mentality that I'm talking about here is is similar enough in that when we occupy a position of privilege or power, in any system, we tend to be defensive against anything that raises our awareness of that and challenges the privilege or power that we have. And that makes talking about these issues very tricky. And so the, you know, a couple of ways that we can and need to go about doing that is to, number one, raise awareness of the systems and the psychology of the systems in the first place, you know, because again, I'll come back to what I said before, and you actually said it much more eloquently than I did. Once we become aware of the systems that we're a part of, they lose a lot of their power over us. You know, once you give something a name and not only give it a name, but you actually can look at the way, the way it tricks you into supporting it, you're much less likely to be tricked into supporting it than you would have been otherwise. So we really need to develop literacy around systems of a privilege and oppression. What is patriarchy? How does patriarchy cause us to, for example, um, you know, value the so-called masculine over the so-called feminine? And what does that mean to women and people of other genders who are not, you know, classified as men? We really need to learn learn how these systems operate. And you don't have to be an expert, you know, you can learn enough to know that if you're in a position of power, you are likely to feel defensive against somebody trying to raise your awareness. And that that in and of itself can go a long way. And then we need to learn how to have conversations and mm -hmm. how to have conversations about the problem in a way that holds people accountable without harming their dignity. And that's really the key. And this is where non-shaming comes in. And it, it can be very difficult, you know, because if you're a person who is, you know, let's go back to me too. You're a woman who, you know, like myself, for example, had spent the past couple of decades in the movement feeling like you were screaming from the sidelines. There's a problem here, but nobody actually wanted to hear it or pay attention and told you it was all in your head and you were making things up. Um, you know, when you finally are taken seriously, it can be hard not to have all of this year, these years of like, 
pent up anger coming out. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it also, so the anger makes sense. Um, and we also need to learn to talk about the issue in a way that helps to raise awareness reduces defensiveness and honors dignity in the process. And I, I really want to be careful that people do not think that I'm saying that the burden of communicating and is on the person with less power and like, Hey, mm. if you want to challenge patriarchy, you better string your words together just so, because if you don't, your message isn't going to be heard. And then it's going to be your fault because then that's blaming people who have less power for having less power. And I don't mean that at all. Um, what I do mean to say is that, the dialogue, we need to be having these conversations as a movement. It's incredibly important. And we're not going to be able to have these conversations unless all of us learn to be committed to raising our awareness around critical issues of human rights and privilege and oppression. And we all commit to building our ability to communicate more effectively. Absolutely. Education is a powerful way to bring real change. And I think we can become very myopic, especially in the vegan movement. If you, your entire world is just animal rights, um, we share this world with other humans and non-human animals. And I think from, from, I can only speak for myself, but I got involved in the vegan movement because of compassion, because I care about others, whether they're fluffy, furry, feathered, scaled, or human, human kind of, you know, family. I care about other people and whether they suffer or not. And I, I think suffering is a, you know, is unnecessary suffering is injustice and that we should care equally about all these things. And I think it's important for us to, to sort of expand our world beyond the sort of, you know, the blinkered nature of being in a movement, because that's what can happen. You can become very blinkered. You have your group speak where everyone uses the same terminology and language and you go to the same events and you watch the same YouTube channels. And, you know, and, and this is why I'm P, uh, PBN. We're trying to sort of expand the conversation out a bit more. And this is why plant-based news and we get accused of not being vegan enough all the time. This is why we tried to make the platform a little more open, a little bit more mainstream, because we wanted to reach non-vegans. What's the point of creating vegan content for vegans talking about veganism? It doesn't actually create any change. You're just building an echo chamber. So it's really important to connect with people who do disagree with you and you can have dialogue with them. But it's so important to communicate in the right way. As you said, there's no point in having a conversation with another human being and, and screaming and shouting at each other um, and uh, with an attempt to try to get an understanding in place. That's never going to happen if you aren't communicating effectively and you aren't using strategy. Of course, you know, within us, the, I often use the example of meat is murder. As a vegan and as a, as a sort of compassionate human being, I genuinely believe that meat is murder. Killing an animal is a form of murder because you are taking the life of an individual with their own mind and their own thoughts and their own feelings. But the language of that meat is murder is not understood by 99% of the planet. When you say that out loud, people don't understand it. You may want to say it. You may have this burning desire to scream it from the rooftops, but you have to translate it and you have to use the skillfulness of language to be able to kind of create that inception. So I love the film Inception about planting a seed in the mind of another person. That's what we have to do is, to, is, is inception. But we have to plant the seed into the mind of the other person without triggering the defense mechanisms. Because I don't know if you've ever seen Inception, the film. When the defense mechanisms of the mind tr tr kick in, then all those kind of the whole world begins to change and attack the person who's the idea in the mind of the other person. And I've been uh, over the years, I've read a, a little, and not, I don't know anywhere near as much as you, of course, being, you know, being in this world, but the psychology and the biochemical nature of the brain is fascinating that when a person feels threat, the neuropronephrine levels, the neurotransmitter levels of the brain inc are increased and a person's mind actually becomes narrow. They're narrow minded. They become more narrow minded because the fight or flight mechanism kicks in designed to get a person out of there. And when you have a core belief and you challenge it from an external source, the brain has evolved to protect itself. Because obviously, if we didn't have that, I could say, Melanie, go jump off that building. It would be really good for you. And you would go, OK, and you'd do it because you wouldn't have anything protecting your core beliefs. Your core beliefs is obviously to protect your body, to protect your, protect your mind and your core beliefs. And it's so fascinating that, that, that if you want to get through to another person, even if you viciously disagree with them, that you have to use the right words and the right language to sort of, I wouldn't say trick them into listening to you, 
But if you want to have a meaningful discussion, a, a dialogue of, of real value, we have to learn to master our emotions. And of course, if you're the victim of, 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 of domestic violence or racism or transphobia or homophobia, you're dealing with a lot of trauma and you're dealing with, with a lot of pain and, and you want to just, you know, go at a person who's been the source of that or a person in the public who may be speaking about these topics in a way that is deeply triggering. But, but I've learned over the years that, you know, if you want people to listen, we have, we have got to find ways if we want to create change, in my opinion, of course, you can go out there and speak your mind and say, whatever you want, you're, we're living in a free country. But if you want to create real change as an advocate, as part of the movement, we've got to learn to master our emotions and be the masters of our words, even if we are feeling deeply pained and troubled inside. Because I think if that real change, if that change that we've talked about is going to happen, the communication is everything. Because without that, there is no future for us as a species if we cannot learn to 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 communicate. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely. And there's a fine line because as you point out, I mean when when people have been on, you know, the lower end of a power differential and have been harmed by another, you know, individual or another social group, um then it's also important that the onus not be on you need to learn to communicate effectively to get other people to stop being abusive, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the ways that I think it's important for all of us to shift our thinking. Um, they talk about this in psychology. There's a lot of, um, of research that's been done on or was in the past. They would look at, you know, what they called battered women syndrome. What is it in these women that is, you know, making them end up in relationships with men that batter them, you know? And mm -hmm. finally, psychologists started saying, well, why don't we start looking at batterer syndrome? What is it? about men who batter that are making them, putting them in the situation where they're victimizing people. So it's this, it really is a fine line where all of us as advocates, you know, it, we have to have a certain degree of, of privilege ourselves to be in a position in the first place of raising awareness. Um, and to your point, when we learn, you know, let's assume all things being equal and we're in a position to have an open conversation, we feel safe enough to have this open conversation and to advocate, you know, on behalf of, of non-human animals, for example. Um, when we learn how to communicate in a way that's healthy, you know, when your process is healthy of communication, you can talk about just about anything without arguing, you know, and when you don't know how to communicate in a way that's healthy or effective, it, you kind of end up arguing about almost everything. So it really comes back to this, you know, this tool that we can learn. And if we do learn it, we can empower ourselves as individuals and really empower our movement and help this movement, the vegan movement, really start to work more closely with other movements as well, because we can more effectively communicate across movements and, um, you know, be supporting other causes, as I think we should be. One of the um, amazing things about creating change is technology. There's so many new and innovative ways in which we're going to quicken the demise of the animal agriculture industry. And one of them is cellular agriculture and precision fermentation. These technologies, which many people are either disgusted by, horrified by, don't know anything, anything about, have varying different forms of reactions in people. Um, I personally believe that if we get behind, as a movement, if we get behind cellular agriculture and precision fermentation, we're going to see an end to the animal agriculture industry in our lifetime. But why is it that so many vegans are so viciously against cellular agriculture and precision fermentation? As soon as they hear about anything to do with animal products, even if it doesn't actually physically come from an animal, there's disgust, there's horror, and then there's sort of this desire to boycott or, you know, what, are, as a psychologist, like, how should we be trying to get vegans on our side when it comes to technologies that could really destroy animal agriculture permanently? <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, I think a lot of people do, a lot of vegans do support cellular agriculture, um, at least many, many vegans that I encounter certainly do. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and even if a number of vegans don't support cellular agriculture, I don't think that's going to make a huge difference in, you know, how quickly cellular agriculture, you know, develops and takes off. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, this is, this is an industry or this is a, this is an initiative that is being supported by a lot of a number of people who have a lot of power. Um, so mm. I think that's going to be happening no matter what happens in the vegan movement in terms of our own conversations around it. I think it does make sense that um, 
I, I can understand why certain vegans feel uncomfortable or reluctant. Um, and, you know, this is why I say it's important to not think of ideology as devoid of psychology. Like on an ideological mm -hmm. level, it's very uncomfortable to think about, like, why would you want to create something that is reminiscent of the very problem we're trying to transform? You know, we want to get rid of that altogether, right? Just like maybe just like it's hard for, for you and me maybe to imagine or, or meat eaters, you know, non-vegans to imagine like, why would we want to create a um, cellular based hamburger made out of baby humans? Like nobody would mm -hmm. want that because we're disgusted by the very concept. And so I'll, I think a lot of vegans think we want to get rid of the whole idea of animals as, you know, instruments for human consumption, as objects of human consumption. And and that makes sense. I mean, that's that's the ideological goal of the movement in some ways. Um, uh, and, you know, people are not just they're, they're psychological beings and, you know, people don't, most people are not going to just go vegan because we ask them to go vegan when we, you know, when the bar is so high right now. And so I think it's really important for vegans to, to recognize that you, you, as our end goal, we obviously don't want people to be thinking of animals as instruments for our own use and working toward that goal is going to require that we, we relate to the humans who we are to the other people who we are trying to, you know, whose minds and hearts we're trying to open, whose behaviors we're working to change to get them to adapt on an institutional level as well as on individual level. We need to do this in a way that speaks to them and that takes psychology into account and, um, and let impact be our guide. You know, what is going to have the most impact as quickly as possible on the greatest number of animals? And, you know, if we can reduce suffering significantly by creating, you know, a, a form of, you know, quote unquote, carnistic product for people to consume that does not contribute to the massive suffering that's happening today, then it's very obvious what the right choice is for us or the most effective choice is. Mm, absolutely. I think for me, it's about taking individuals in the, the entity and the sentience and in the cells and separating the two that we are not our cells that we are I, I might be an organism like you made up of billions of cells but the cells aren't robbie robbie isn't the cells the sentience that drives this meat suit this this living organism is a magical cosmic scientific whatever it is we don't even know what it is a precious gift and that's what we're fighting for that is what we're trying to protect we're not trying to protect cells we're not trying to protect flesh we're trying to protect consciousness and sentience and i think this is the, dif the difference be between the way people see a, a state and this is the interesting of this the psychology of the steak and then the cow the cow is a living breathing sentient living uh, individual like I am and then there's the steak which is just flesh it's not living it's not dead it's just flesh it's just cells and you consume it and I think you know we've obviously as vegans have created that disconnect we've unplugged from the matrix <laughs> and now we're saying to the vegans you need to plug back into it <laughs> and they're like I can't do this I can't face eating a piece of meat because all I see is the individual I don't see just flesh anymore because that's what we used to see we used to sit down in front of a piece of flesh and we used to just see flesh and cells not an individual so it's that sort of like twist of the of the of the psychology and we're asking people to sort of twist it back but the reality is we're not asking vegans to eat this stuff we're not asking vegans to eat cellular agricultured meat or um, cell-based meat or, or persistent fermentation. We just want them to understand that this is a powerful technology to destroy the animal agriculture industry. And every minute you waste criticizing it, you could spend it on attacking the meat industry and the people that are causing the real damage to our world. Um, so it's, it will remain, I think, as you say, discussions in vegan circles and spaces, but hopefully it stays there because I think it's not very productive. <laughs> but move, moving on from that topic, um, before I let you go, what are some of your top tips for being a better advocate? Uh, you know, just give us a little bit of a summary of how we can be better advocates to push this movement forward. What are some of the things that we need to remember as people um, so that we can continue to grow the vegan movement and um, expand it into the future? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, we have at CVAR, a Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, we've just launched our first course um, and we are having now digital, digital courses online that we're making available to, to all 
all advocates. So one thing I just want to put out there is to to have anybody who wants to improve their advocacy to come to veganadvocacy.org. Um, we have a lot of materials and and tips there, far more than I could possibly share here. Um, and, um, you know, I would say, let, number one, let, let impact be your guide, right? When you ask yourself, you know, it is pause and ask yourself, what is the impact of this choice or this behavior going to be, right? The, the psychotherapist, Terrence Real, he works with, um, he works with couples and, and he says to his couples, you know, he's talk, talking about married couples in this um, instance. He says, you know, you have a choice. You can be right or you can be married. You decide what you want to be. And I would say that to <laughs> vegans, that right? You know, you can be, you can be um, right or you can be effective, right? So, so ask yourself what is going to be effective, you know? Okay. Maybe it's true. Maybe this is more, you know, accurately referred to as a piece of murdered flesh or slaughtered flesh, but how effective is that going to be when I share that with, um, with somebody else. So, so really pause and think about, think about what the impact of your words or your choices are going to be on, on others and, you know, get informed, get informed about what kinds of change strategies work, what kind of advocacy works in general. Um, most people get more training to operate a cash register than they do to try to change when they're trying to change the world. So, you know, get educated, um, veganadvocacy.org. We have a bunch of videos. We have so many resources. So just learn the practical techniques and they're there, but really let impact be your guide and commit to building your own knowledge base. Don't go on instinct because a lot of what feels intuitively like the right thing to do when it comes to advocating isn't. Amazing. Before I let you go, um, I always like to ask my guests this one final question. If you were on a desert island and it was just you and a pig... Of course, you don't eat the pig because you're a vegan. If you listen to this podcast, you know this question. I'm going to give you one vegan dish, one book, and one music album. What would you take with you to your desert island? Oh, my goodness. That's uh, <laughs> one vegan dish, one book, and one album. Um, well, that's a great question. What would my dish be? I don't know. I just love food so much. I don't think I could ever narrow it down to one dish. Uh, cooking and eating are my passions. Um <laughs> Definitely wouldn't eat the pig. I think a book that I would take would be um, something by Eckhart Tolle. Um, Amazing. Because I can read it over and over again and keep getting new. I'm assuming I'm on the desert island for the long haul. <laughs> you are. And what would be your music of choice? That's uh, that's also a good question. I, I don't know. I'm kind of a eclectic, so I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe something by George Winston. Um, some piano by George Winston. Something that I can listen to over and over again and not worry about getting bored of it. Sounds brilliant. Dr. Melanie Joy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. An hour has flown by. Um, I feel like there's actually three more hours worth of talking we could do because your knowledge and experience really spans you know, many, many hours of discussion. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Robbie. It's always a pleasure. And you're just so you're so easy to talk to. And I could say the same right back at you. Amazing. Thanks for joining us, everyone. This is the PBN Podcast. We'll be back next week with more veganism, food, fashion, animals, and everything in between. 